Sambhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudhasa Bodhang Dhammang Sankhang Namasami So we've been having a kind of Dhamma feast these past few days with um, many, many visitors, uh, elder monks, elder nuns, from different parts of the world, people who've uh, dedicated many years of their lives to practice. And uh, it's, it's um, a great joy just to be in that sort of uh, field of, of goodness, a sense of, of, of being very blessed uh, to be part of <coughs> this um, gathering here at Amrawati. <coughs> And I feel also very um, honoured, humbled to have been invited to uh, offer some words of reflection on Dhamma, uh, hopefully to help us all on our journey to Nibbana, to liberate the heart from every kind of suffering. Uh, and we have the teachings of the Buddha, we have the teachings of Lumpur Cha who was particularly skilled in uh, offering guidance, um, in taking the, the teachings, of the, the, the essence of the Buddha's teachings, and uh, combining that with a very skillful use of the monastic structures. Um, I think often people can think of structure rules as being something uh, limiting something harmful, something unpleasant, something we don't like. Uh, but when we look at them in the context of liberating the heart, uh, they're an immense blessing. We might not always like them, uh, but what they do is that they show us the areas where we're stuck, uh, the areas where where um, yeah, where we're stuck, basically, where there's an attachment to some view or opinion about how we should be, um, how things should be, how people should be, how everything should be. And um, it's uh, having, having these clear um, structures uh, enables us to see that, see it very clearly. Uh, I didn't have very much contact with Lumpur Cha, just... Um, I met him a few times, spent a little bit of time with him when I visited Thailand for the first time. And uh, uh, so mostly uh, I rely on on stories and also on reading the very fine uh, collection of his teachings. And um, it's interesting, the story told the other day, which I think has been repeated already once, about how uh, he tended to, um, uh, teaching was actually very, very simple and uh, quite repetitive, and would repeat the same themes over and over again. This is something that's really come across to me since reading you know, quite a number of his talks, and just seeing how uh, always comes back to Anicca Dukkha Anatta, uh, impermanence, uh, unsatisfactoriness, the, the limitations of the conditioned world uh, in terms of lasting peace and satisfaction, the world of conditions, and, and not self, the selflessness. And uh, I was actually talking about uh, this, the anecdote was about somebody who uh, re re recollecting a particularly powerful teaching that Lumpur Cha had given, a very powerful transmission that had transformed this person's life, uh, uh, that um, 
basically everything changes. And I was actually thinking back to an occasion at, at Chithurst Monastery on my very first visit there when the Pocha was there. And uh, I remember going, uh, one of the Anagarikas, Anagarika Jordan, who was a great sort of very skilled at kind of um, arranging things. And uh, I was a laywoman at the time. And he suggested that I might like to take a tea tray up for Ajahn Chah. I remember going up into this up, upstairs room at Chithurst House. In those days, women were allowed upstairs. And uh, going into the room, and there was this incredible atmosphere. And Ajahn Chah was sitting on a bench. Ajahn Prabhakara was there. And Jankiti Saru. Ajahn Viradhamma, I think. And there was just, just this... Uh, yeah, the atmosphere was really, really charged and uh, sort of presented the tray and then Lumpur Chah said something which Ajahn Babakar translated and basically the question was, you know, how's your practice? And uh, I said, oh, well, it changes. <laughs> Whereupon Ajahn Chah gave a whole teaching about change. <laughs> So he would use any any situation to uh, uh, point to uh, what is most obvious when we think about it, but what's so easily forgotten. Um, things change. It ties in with a uh, one of the. Um, I don't know, those of you who have been into the office here at Amrawati, there's a little desk calendar and it has a, a quotation for you know, each day you tear off the sheet and there's a quotation, some kind of, and some of them are wonderful and some of them are less wonderful, but <laughs> one day there was this one that really caught, caught, my, caught my eye, which was basically time stops everything happening together. <laughs> And uh, I, I, I've pondered this quite a lot since since the date that I, I noticed this. And um, what what it what it did for me was to, to um, you know I don't know about any of you, but sometimes we can um, we can just feel really pressurized by all the things that need to happen. And all the things that, that must be done, and um, we forget that there's such a thing as time. That things, you know, if if we can just relax with our list, that in due course things will happen. It's, it's not that it all has to happen at once. So thinking you know, back to those very early days at Chithurst. When Lumpur Cha was visiting, and uh, there were, I think there were about seven or eight monks all together. Ajahn Cha and uh, a number of lay people, including myself, in the house, you know, practically falling down, der- derelict, in a very bad state of repair. Uh, holes in the roof, holes in the floor, mushrooms growing out of the walls. And uh, Ajahn Chah's very um, helpful advice to the to the Sangha at that time, you know, just to, you know, just, um, you know, not to be in a hurry, you know, to make it perfect, as a way of counterbalancing that tendency to feel it's got to be perfect straight away right now. That incredible pressure we put into our lives to to get things done, to make things right. Uh, Amrawati, in coming here, descriptions, well, I was here actually at the beginning, you know, remembering Ajahn Chandapalo's talk the first evening about how um, uh, he was the... uh, monastery plumber because he'd done a degree in engineering or something (laughs) 
people thought he would know about plumbing. And what he didn't say was that the whole of the first winter retreat, he and Venerable Subato spent most of the time underneath the buildings fixing the pipes. And so this image of their feet sticking out from under the, <laughs> under the buildings in the snow. There's these two pairs of feet sticking out and they're fixing the pipes. And uh, there was a lot of that. And uh, the idea of it ever being comfortable was not something we could ever... You, it was inconceivable that Amrawati could be comfortable. <laughs> and... Uh, of course, it took many years and an enormous amount of effort uh, to to reach the um, the uh, state of, of of comfort and and beauty. It's a very beautiful place now. A lot of care and attention to detail. And what's perhaps even more beautiful is just the atmosphere of the place. You know, the sense of these many, many years of you know, people coming to practice meditation, you know, constant encouragement to contemplate these simple teachings of the Buddha, to apply them in our lives. And the you know, countless uh, women and men who've come and uh, spent you know, maybe just a day, a couple of days, maybe just an afternoon practicing and obviously for many people, you know, years and decades even, people applying themselves to listening to the teachings, applying them in their, in their own lives. Uh, many hours of, of meditation that's uh, created a very, very particular atmosphere that people notice when they come here. A place of Dhamma, a place of safety, a place of practice. And uh, even the animals, uh, the, the birds that kind of sit in the middle of the pathways as you walk by, you think, well, you should be frightened of me. <laughs> and they're, they're, they're quite at ease around human beings, squirrels. And it's useful to contemplate this fact of change uh, in terms of our own practice. You know, sometimes liberation can seem so very far away, enlightenment, nibbana. You just think, well, what's that got to do with me? Um, you know, how can I ever um, aspire to attain to, to such a state? How can I ever deal with my, my difficulties? How can I ever liberate the heart from all my confusion, uh, problems, restless mind, lust, greed, confusion? There are stories about Lumpo Cha encouraging us to see our practice as you know, like the earthworm practice. Arjun Sabeda used to encourage us in the earthworm practice. You know, just dealing with what's in front of us right now. You know, recognizing dukkha as it arises. Uh, you know, can we recognize dukkha? Can we recognize suffering? Can we recognize the struggle? And can we can we just um, contemplate it? Can we take an interest in it without simply reacting, trying to get rid of it as quickly as possible, or <clears throat> confusing it, adding to it? It's my fault. I'm a hopeless case. I'll never be any good. Or it's their fault. Uh, looking for somebody to blame. Uh, Have you noticed, however, anything goes wrong? There's an immediate search for somebody to blame. Uh, Because once we've found somebody to blame, then we can relax. At least least it's not my fault. It's their fault, somebody else's fault. (laughs) 
But contemplating dukkha is about actually really being present for it, really attending to the struggle in the heart. This is not so easy sometimes because it it does demand um, a kind of honesty, a kind of willingness um, to acknowledge um, our fears, our desires. And sometimes these can be a little bit embarrassing, a little bit humiliating. You know, sort of sense of competitiveness, wanting to be the best. Uh, fear of being the worst. Fear of um, acknowledging our, our sense of inadequacy. Uh, I'm having a little pause because I'm not quite sure what to say next and I'd really like to be able to say something that's helpful um, rather than just burbling on. (laughs) So excuse me while I go quiet for a few moments. Um, It's been interesting for me... um, these uh, days actually observing the different elders speaking, sharing Dhamma. And uh, one of the things that I think has been most delightful is the, uh, their sense of presence uh, and just the, the, the joy and, and delight that arises uh, from that presence. And uh, you know, sometimes it it happens for us, and sometimes it doesn't. And uh, and that was one of the things about Lumpur Chat. One of the things that I see Ajahn Liam is just this sort of just the sort of simplicity, the ordinariness um, of their of their way of being, and. Uh, just that very ordinariness is is quite marvellous. And uh, just to to recognise the way that our our very self-consciousness tends to to mess that up. Uh, It it, it takes a lot to be utterly simple and utterly present. And... uh, so I, I, I consider myself, and I think for all of us, just an incredible blessing in being around people who, who are able to, to be like that, to kind of um, point to a possibility that each one of us has. Uh, and it's not something you can really fake. It's a matter of, and it's, it's not something that just happens it's almost as though we have to go through that sense of um, self-consciousness. Uh, we have to acknowledge uh, the sense of self uh, before we can li- really let it go, uh, before we can transcend it. And uh, in some ways, this is, this is the work of our community life, our life in the monasteries, is actually regularly facing up to that sense of self. You know, that struggle we have um, with each other. You know, sometimes people are surprised that um, monks and nuns aren't always peaceful and happy and um, easygoing and pleasant to be around. And that's because, you know, we spend a lot of the time just um, having to endure the struggle of selfhood. Uh, as it arises, uh, and it arises in relation relation to each other, 
You know, it's like living uh, with a lot of mirrors. Uh, and we don't always like what we see, but it's there. And as I said before, it's, it's a real blessing to see that. Uh, we can see where we need to attend, where we need to let go. And we've had the arrival of another teacher. Uh, we've had our living embodied teachers and uh, just yesterday, uh, Rojna arrived. Rojna died three weeks ago, a little bit more than three weeks ago. And yesterday her body came. And uh, that's perhaps one of the most powerful teachers of all. And uh, we were talking among ourselves and just marveling at, at her timing to be able to arrive in the midst of such an assembly. And she always would would come to the Sangha gatherings, the big events. She was always there at the Katinas, the Wessak festivals. Um, And now for her to to arrive uh, just yesterday. And uh, she arrived and they hadn't (coughs) really prepared the body very well. And she was in this um, very beautiful coffin, made of woven, rush, rush woven coffin. And uh, and I couldn't help but exclaim when I walked into the Chapel of Rest, you know, what a wonderful coffin. And her son, Tavara, was there, obviously very um, distressed. Um, it was a very big time for him. And, uh, you know, I hope that my remark wasn't seen as irreverent. But it was just quite spontaneous. What a beautiful coffin. And then... Um, Tavara and the undertakers and Ajahn Amaro left and um, Sister Brahmavara and Sister Kirinyani, Warada and myself um, had the job of, of um, preparing uh, Rojana for the many visitors who would surely be coming over the next days. And Tavara very thoughtfully had brought some, some of her clothes and um, so we spent, I don't know how long it was, a very special time for the four of us. It wasn't something that any of us had ever done before. You know, cutting cutting through the um, the hospital sort of shroud that they they put on her body, moving her limbs, um, you know, bathing the places that need to be bathed. And then um, you know, lifting the body, putting, removing the the padding, and and putting um, you know, some bin liners and waterproof padding underneath. Um, and then putting her clothes on. Uh, it always felt very. Um, ordinary in some ways and it was beautiful the way that we just worked together you know, we were all definitely there and each responding to what needed to happen next it was interesting when it was first clear that this was what we were going to be doing my first reaction was to go off and find something else to do <laughs> you know Sister Brahmawara seemed quite confident about it and you know, I thought oh, my goodness this are we going to do are we ready I thought oh no no I'll, I'll go somewhere else and I thought come on Chandasiri we'll stay and it was all absolutely fine you know even sort of holding holding her head while we um, bathed her and put her clothes on um, you know initially there's sort of, sort a of natural sense of drawing back but then just doing it and it's so ordinary you know these bodies are just so ordinary and they have a a weight they're moist you know there was plenty of moisture there they were cold it was cold but it it was just so ordinary just just the human body 
And then some of the monks came. And uh, it was quite sweet because as we were, you know, we, we, we all commented on this, you know, that as we were um, placing her limbs in particular positions and sort of putting the clothes on, you know, taking care to make sure she was comfortable. <laughs> Just a sort of instinct to kind of make sure that the limbs are in a position that would be comfortable. Uh, not having any wrinkles underneath. Uh, making sure that the head was in a comfortable position. And we also thought she would have been very delighted. You know, that the four of us were attending to her in that way. And I don't know if she would have thought of it, but... Perhaps she was also delighted at the incredible gift of just that she's given to all of us just through coming here at this time, being brought here at this time, uh, in order for us to, to contemplate um, her own body and to contemplate her own life, the beauty of her life, the goodness of her life. And those of you who go to visit her will notice that uh, her knitting is still there with her. (laughs) Those of you who don't know, she was somebody who loved to to knit things. She was always knitting. And she knitted garments. Probably everybody in the Sangha received some garment from her at some point. You know, wrist wrist warmers, woolly hats, scarves, jerseys. You know, all kinds of things. And she was a prolific knitter, and she even had these special fundraising knitathons, you know, sort of marathons. She would just sit and knit for hours and hours and hours, and people would sponsor her for a certain amount for each stitch or in each row. <laughs> and uh, I mean, she, there were modest amounts of money that she raised, um, but there was always this feeling of excitement and delight that she'd raised 93 pounds and 37 pence for the Sangha. Or, and I can't remember the exact advance, but they were of that, that order. But just the, the delight that um, she, she derived from being able to, to be involved and to support in that way. And particularly because her health was, um, her health was poor. And another of the remarkable things about her was that she had a, you know, a liver transplant. She had somebody else's liver. And Sister Brahmawara was telling me that she'd made medical history because she was the longest surviving liver transplant patient. So, I mean, her body is particularly remarkable. And uh, she would often talk about the, the donor, uh, Rita, who had a heart attack, I think, when she was doing her ironing. And... Uh, <laughs> So she would share merit with this person who had enabled her to to live for so many more years than she would have done otherwise. So, um, so we have um, another teacher. And those of you who feel able, who feel you would like to, um, I know that you'd be very welcome to go and you know, look at look at look at the body and you know, even touch it. Um, as a way of just recollecting where we're all going. Using it as an encouragement to really make the very, very best use of this opportunity that each of us has. each of us has as a human being, each of us has as a human being who has can come here to hear, hear the teachings, to practice, to apply the teachings in our own lives, to liberate the heart, to really take an interest in the suffering of our lives, the way that we cause suffering to ourselves, and the way that we often cause suffering to others. You know, when we're not careful, when we're not restrained, 
in the way that we speak, in the way that we act, in the way that we treat each other. To really cultivate the qualities of Hiriotapa, like the guardians of the world, these two figures at the entrance to the temple, just to remind us, you know, to have a sense of, of conscience. If we if we do something unwholesome, if we if we slip up, say something mean, say something that's hurtful to somebody, uh, cause harm to ourselves or to others, you know, that we we contemplate that, we ponder that. You know, not not wallowing in guilt, but just thinking that was a that was a shame. I didn't need to do that. So sharpening our sense of hearing, our conscience, and our concern, otapa, concern you know, for the effects of our lives. You know, so that we live carefully, we live responsibly on this planet with each other. So that at the end of our life, you know, before we quite get to the chapel of rest, before our last breath, we're able to look back with a sense of, of gratitude, a sense of gladness that we've been able to, to do some good in our lives, that we've been able to contemplate these wonderful teachings Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, Three Characteristics, and so on, really applying them in our lives in the way that we've been encouraged to by our great teachers. And that the heart is perhaps a little bit freer, a little bit less dukkha in there, a little bit less struggle, a little bit more joy, gladness, brightness. And then perhaps we too will be able to come, offer ourselves as uh, teachers in the Chapel of Rest. So these are just some um, reflections. Um, It's the day after the late night sit, and so not to make it too long a talk, but I hope that some of this has been helpful. And I offer it with sincere good wishes for each and every one of you that you may carry on with this wonderful teaching and practice and experience ever greater peace and joy in your lives.